Hey, thanks for joining us here at Life Church, where we are one church meeting in multiple locations with a mission and a passion of leading people to become fully devoted followers of Christ. Now, if you're connected to Life Church in any way, you probably know that July is the time for our annual hit summer series called At the Movies, where we take popular movies and pull biblical truth right out of them. These messages are available exclusively at all of our Life Church locations and at Church Online. So if you want to check them out, make sure to attend the location nearest you or one of the many experiences we have happening throughout the week at Church Online. For the rest of you tuning in on the Life Church app, our website, or any other Life Church platform, we have another episode of the Craig Rochelle Leadership Podcast here for you today, where Craig will be talking on the topic about how to institutionalize urgency. How do we as leaders overcome a complacent mindset and have a urgent pursuit of future success? Let's check it out. Well, welcome to another episode of the Craig Rochelle Leadership Podcast. I'm really honored and excited that you'd spend some time with me again this month. Uh, today, we're gonna do part one of a two-part teaching called Institutionalizing Urgency. In every organization, uh, the bias is toward complacency over time, not toward urgency. And so as leaders, we're gonna talk about how we in the culture actually institutionalize a culture of urgency. Uh, before we dive in, I wanna say a big thank you to those of you who are sharing on social media. It means a lot to me and uh, hopefully will engage other people who can listen as well. If you haven't subscribed, I would love for you to subscribe on iTunes. So the first Thursday of every month, this will automatically come to you. You can always watch on YouTube as well or go to life.church slash leadership podcast. Uh, it's also helpful when you leave a review. And so to those of you who do so, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, every month, I want to answer just some questions, if you have any, or if you'd like to leave comments, uh, please feel free to do so. You can write us at leadership at life.church, leadership at life.church. And then at the end of the teaching, I'm going to give you some questions. If you uh, have a team, it's always helpful to listen in groups. And then there'll be some application questions that you might want to uh, address together at the end of the teaching. So let's dive into a couple of questions that came in this month, and then we'll talk about how do we institutionalize urgency. Uh, Amanda asked this. She said, I'd really love to hear how you sharpened your leadership skills early in your career when you were balancing the stresses and joys of life with young children. Uh, now I'm balancing the stresses and joys of life with older children, and so it's still that way. But anyway, good question, Amanda. Uh, how did I grow as a leader in, in the early years? I made a list of some things that I did. Um, I attended a lot of conferences. I wanted to learn not so much what others do, but how they think, learn how people think. Uh, I try to take dead time and make it productive time. For example, this year, I have a goal to listen to one book a week. And the way I'm doing that basically is, is instead of just driving, I'm listening while I'm driving. When I'm working out, I'm listening as well. And I am on track uh, and learning a lot. So read, 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 listen, listen, listen. Uh, I listen to a lot of podcasts as well. I also like to read books or listen to podcasts with a group of people so that we can discuss them. I'm discussing a couple of books with uh, groups. And so not only do I learn from the books, but I learn their perspective as well. Uh, I like to put myself in uncomfortable places. That's what helps me to grow as a leader. I try to attempt things that I haven't done before. Uh, I seek mentors all the time. What's interesting, and this is something that I actually did early on, is I, I taught on leadership even before I felt qualified to teach on leadership. It's amazing how much you learn when you teach. And so... Really, when our church was a year old, I was teaching a class called Out of the Nest, essentially for people who felt they might be called to ministry, uh, how, do you, how do we push them out of the nest? I started teaching communication um, even when I was a young communicator, and so I learned a lot by doing that. Um, and then one thing I try to do to grow is I try to add one discipline to my life every year, one discipline. Um, a couple of years ago, I started journaling. Uh, I, uh, last year I started planning the day very specifically. This year I started making some positive declarations. I'll share more about that in the next episode. But those are just some things I do to always grow. You don't grow accidentally, you only grow intentionally. You have to have an intentional plan. Kellen asked this question, uh, what is something you do now that you wish you would have done at the age of 20? 
Uh, good question. One thing for me is journaling. I can kick myself for not doing this for all those years. Another thing for me is enjoying the ride. I just was way, way, way too intense and didn't see the blessings along the way. Another thing, I'll talk about this in the next episode too, but I would have thought longer term. For example, now, whenever I'm trying to think of, can I do such and such, I try to ask myself, uh, let's put, can I put a 10 by that number? And if I wanna reach 100 people, can I reach a, multiply that times 10? If I wanna reach 1,000 people, how could I reach 10,000 people? So I wanna think bigger and think long-term. A mentor said to me, and this was really helpful, I wish I'd heard this earlier, but a mentor said, you'll very likely overestimate what you can do in the short run, and you'll very likely underestimate what you can do through a lifetime of faithfulness. I wish I'd known that in my 20s because I grossly overestimated what I could do at the age of 23, 24, 25, but I grossly underestimated what God could do through me over decades of being faithful to Him. Uh, you will overestimate what you can do in the short run, but you'll underestimate what you can do through a lifetime of faithfulness. Good questions. Uh, let's dive into the topic for this week. We'll do part one, and then next month we'll do part two. And the theme is institutionalizing urgency. Uh, what do we see in, in a startup organization? If you've got a startup ministry, a nonprofit, a business, you're going to attack things urgently. Why? Because you have to. Everything matters on getting th things done now quickly and done with excellence. And so if you urgently do the right things, you will likely see success. If you urgently do the right things, you'll likely to, uh, start to see success. The problem is that success feeds pride Pride kills urgency, and that's why people say nothing fails like success. Let me say this again, because it's really important. When you're doing the right things urgently with excellence, you'll start to see success. The challenge is when you become successful, success feeds pride. Wow, we know what we're doing. Wow, we're good at this. Wow, we're getting it done. Success feeds pride. Pride kills urgency. That's why nothing fails like success. What tends to happen in an organization when you start you add people who have intensity and urgency. When people enter an organization that's been developed over time, they often don't enter the organization that feels successful with the same sense of urgency. If you start adding enough people that don't embody this culture and attitude of urgency, then over time, the whole organization starts to see the beginning of the decline. In fact, I'm gonna argue this, that in any organization over time, urgency is not the default mode, complacency is. Let me say it again. Urgency is not the default mode, complacency is. In fact, I'll illustrate from uh, the Bible, Luke chapter 12, Jesus told this story, and I wanna look at it through the lens of urgency and complacency. This is what Jesus said, Luke 12, 16. He said, Jesus told this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. Okay, and let me just stop there. Uh, what this doesn't say is what could be obvious that earlier in the year, this guy urgently got up early in the morning. He plowed the ground, he planted seed, he watered it, he worked hard. He worked 12, 14, 15 hour days. He put in the hard work while he urgently did the right things. And then he saw an abundant harvest. Verse 17, the guy thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then, let me give you a little clue. In the next part of the verse, the guy is going to talk to himself. And let me tell you what he's not going to say. He's not going to say, wow, I've got a great responsibility. I cannot take this success for granted. I've got to multiply it. Next year, we could have a drought. You know, I, I better store some. I, I, I'm going to need to plant some more. I have uh, a calling to give some away because I've been so blessed with, with, with this abundant harvest. He doesn't say, that, say this. What does he say? He says to himself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? What do we see? Urgency is where he started. But what was the default mode? After he had success, complacency set in. Hey, I'll just take life easy. I mean, I'm already successful. I might as well enjoy it. That's why I've always said that the greatest threat to future success 
is current success. The greatest threat to future success is current success. Why? Because success feeds pride. Pride kills urgency and nothing fails like success. Here's the problem with complacency. Complacency is difficult to see in the mirror. Complacency is difficult to see in the mirror. Listen, if you are complacent, chances are you do not know it. In fact, as I'm talking about this, you might be thinking of other team members, people that you work with. They're like, hey, they need to hear this, man. They're so complacent, okay? The reality is if they were listening to this, they might be thinking about you as well. In fact, I wanna encourage you at some point to be really, really honest and acknowledge any area of complacency where you're, you're doing your job like it's a job, not like it's a calling. You're, you're, you're showing up, but you're not passionate about it. There's a difference between having a routine and being committed to doing what's right. You might want to acknowledge it. And if you recognize you're complacent, declare war on complacency. Just say, I'm not gonna tolerate this as a leader. I expect more of myself. I believe God demands more of me. My team expects more of me. Our organization is worth it. Declare war on complacency. The reason you have to do this is because you cannot change what you're willing to tolerate. You have to recognize this is not something I'm gonna tolerate. I'm going to attack it. Now, here's a little formula that I put together, a little equation to help understand how to have a sense of sustained ur urgency. Uh, three things to add it together. Uh, the first thing is this, outside opposition plus a divine calling plus limited time equals sustained urgency. Outside opposition plus divine calling plus limited time equals sustained urgency. When you recognize that your success is not guaranteed, that there's outside opposition. In my world, we call it spiritual opposition. In your world, it might be an economic opposition. It might be um, some kind of competition down the street, whatever, it's not guaranteed. Plus a, a calling, a sense that this is what I'm created to do. Plus limited time, recognizing that we don't have much time equals a sustained urgency. Kind of like years ago, whenever my fraternity house uh, caught on fire and we all got outside and recognized there was one of our brothers that was still inside. Well, guess what? We had outside opposition to fire. We didn't expect a calling. We must protect our brother. Limited time, if we don't get him out, this house is going down. And so what do we do? We had a, a deep sense of urgency. And this is a picture of what we need in our organizations. And I wanna unpack it in four very practical thoughts. We'll cover two today and then two in the next episode in order to institutionalize a culture of urgency because urgency is not the default mode in any organization, complacency is. Uh, so number one of two things we'll cover today. The first one is this. I wanna encourage you to embody healthy skepticism. Number one, embody healthy skepticism. Recognize that if you're successful, all success is temporary. What works today may not work tomorrow. In fact, um, one of my friends always says this, uh, Andy Stanley says uh, about your model and your mission, he says, date your model, marry your mission. In other words, what you're called to do, what, you're, what the product you're create, creating, the ministry that you're embracing, whatever that is, that doesn't change. But how you fulfill that mission is open to change and must change. Date your model, marry your mission. I didn't say date a model, but if you want to, that'd be fine with me. Date your model, marry your mission. In fact, uh, I like watching Shark Tank with my whole family. Uh, it's entertaining and educational. And there was one time this uh, lady presented a product that I think it was called the Happy Mat. Brilliant product, colorful, great design. We're all watching this going, she's gonna get a deal, no doubt about it. It was a mat that had a little bowl on it for kids and the mat and the bowl were one piece. So you could put it in the dishwasher, really great product. And it looked like she was gonna get a deal, but at the end, Barbara said to her, I can't invest in you. And basically, and here's why uh, she said, I'm out. And she told the lady, you have faith, but not fear. You have faith, but not fear. Anytime you're taking a product to market, you have to believe in your product. But at the same time, you have to have an awareness that you don't have all the answers. You, you don't have the, the, the one ticket to success. You, you, your product is not guaranteed to make it. You have to embody healthy skepticism. And although this lady had a wonderful product, all the sharks were out, why? Because she did not embody healthy skepticism. Great product, 
all faith, but no real understanding that something could go wrong. So the big question to ask, and we talked about this earlier, is about outside opposition. What is happening outside that could hurt us on the inside? You have to start there and you have to be realistic about it. Uh, in my world, I lead a group of churches and I made a short list of some things on the outside that could hurt us on the inside. Uh, people today are more skeptical about big and organized and our church appears to some big and organized. Uh, there's a general bias against what's known as a mega church. And so people generally might have negative thoughts about what, what I do. Uh, the, in the secularization of our country, uh, people don't see a need for God. And so that, that's an outside force I need to recognize. Uh, we're recognizing in the whole global church world that people are coming to church uh, less frequently. They used to come you know, four times a month. Now it might be three times a month or two times a month. In some places, once a month because they're so busy. Uh, where I live, because oil prices are down, the economy is much weaker. These are all outside forces that I have to recognize could impact the day-to-day -day opportunities and mission that we're trying to accomplish. And so you have to start with um, embodying healthy skepticism. What could go wrong? You don't have all the answers. Uh, you need to be very, very honest about what could go wrong. The second thought I have is this. Number one, embody healthy skepticism. Number two, I wrote down in my notes, attack, don't yak. Attack, don't yak. Why? Because as any organization grows, movement naturally slows. Let me say that again. This is really important. As your organization grows, movement naturally slows. When you're a startup, you might have two or three decision makers. Once your organization gets bigger, you, you might have layers of decision makers. Suddenly, bureaucracy that you thought would be helpful actually slows your progress. It's more difficult to push ideas through. There's, there's more discussion, more meetings, more PowerPoint presentation, less activity. In fact, as any organization ages, there's a natural movement from what I call a bias for action to a bias for discussion. Let me say it again. As your organization ages, there's a natural progress from a bias for action to a bias for discussion. As leaders, we must lead with a bias toward action, a bias toward action. We don't just talk, we do. In fact, what I want in our organization is I want people that when we make mistakes, because we're all gonna make mistakes, I, I would rather see aggressive mistakes than passive ones. I want people to understand if we're gonna make mistakes, we're gonna make them attacking, doing, striving, not sitting back, over-analyzing, over-discussing, uh, and, and, and not creating any type of movement. In fact, if I can be real honest, this leadership podcast is something that had been in my heart for years and years and years, but what did I do? I procrastinated, I put it off, I told myself, well, I'm not sure anybody would really care, blah, 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 blah. And then one day I recognized I'd been talking about this, thinking about this for a long time, and I was completely going against something that's, that I've always said. I'm gonna, if I'm gonna make mistakes, I'm gonna make aggressive ones, not passive ones. And instead I'd been sitting by passively talking. Why? Because as my organization has grown and aged, we've moved from a bias to action to a bias for discussion. I put down on my notes just a few thoughts about people who have a bias for action. Uh, if you have a bias for action, you typically start early and you stay focused. Uh, when you have a bias for action, you make decisions quickly, you're on the attack. Uh, when you have a bias for action, you make corrections quickly. When you make a mistake, you say, hey, that was stupid, let's, let's correct it and, and move on. Uh, I believe that if you have a bias for action, you return correspondence, email, phone calls, and you care for people in a timely manner. I believe you seize opportunities that others only dream about. I believe that you do what needs to be done. We don't sit around waiting for someone else to pick up a piece of trash or, or to uh, put, rearrange the office in the, in the right way. If it needs to be done, hey, I'm gonna get it done. This is important. And so I'm not too important to get something important done. Uh, when you have a bias for action, you start meetings on time, you end on time, and all of your meetings have a purpose. When, you, when your organization ages, guess what happens? You, you often become meeting heavy. 
You never change the world by sitting in a meeting, okay? Make sure your meetings are, are, they start on time, end on time, always have a purpose. Here's what we talked about. Here's what we're gonna do about this. Here's who's gonna do it, when they're gonna do it by, how we're gonna hold them accountable. If not, then we're not gonna have that meeting. Uh, I even argue, and my staff makes fun of me for this, but when you uh, lead with urgency, you walk quickly, okay? You're going somewhere, you're on a mission. Now, all this to be said, it's important to recognize that the goal is not activity, the goal is productivity. And we need to focus on this. The goal is not just busy work, not just activity, it's productivity. The reality is you can be active but not productive. And with urgency, we do not want frenetic activity. We want focused activity. We wanna be actively doing the right things with a sense of urgency. When you're actively doing the right things with a sense of urgency and excellence, that leads to success. But when we're successful, we don't just say, hey, what am I gonna do now? Take life easy? No, now I've got a great responsibility. We've gotta continue to build upon this. So let's review and then we'll look at some key questions. The greatest threat to future success is current success. Why? Because success feeds pride, pride kills urgency, nothing fails like success. We have to recognize urgency in our organizations is not the default mode, complacency is. The problem is complacency is difficult to see in the mirror. I wanna challenge you to recognize any area of complacency in your heart, then declare war on it. Why? Because we cannot change what we're willing to tolerate. Here's our little formula. Outside opposition plus divine calling plus limited time equals sustained urgency. For those of you who are in ministry, recognize you have outside spiritual opposition. You are called by God to make a difference. You've got a limited time. Guess what? It's time to lead urgently. Number one, embody healthy skepticism because all success is temporary. What works today may not work tomorrow. Number two, attack, don't yak. As your organization grows, movement naturally slows. As your organization ages, people tend to move from having a bias for action to a bias for discussion. We are gonna lead with a bias for action. And again, the goal is not activity, the goal is productivity. Some questions, three of them for you to apply uh, with yourself or with your team. Number one, what are five forces that could significantly and negatively impact your organization, what should you change about how you are leading, okay? What are five forces that could significantly and negatively impact your organization? Then once you name those, ask yourself, what should you change because of these about how you are leading? It might be you're in an aging community. It might be there's a dramatic change in your economy. It might be that a change in technology could make your product obsolete, whatever it is. Look at those outside things and and name at least five so it gets you to be more aware. Then number two, okay? Since you will lead with a bias toward action, number two, ask this. What are two things you've considered doing that you've continued to procrastinate? What are two things that you've considered doing that you're continued to procrastinate. Now, either commit to move toward your ideas or cross them off your list of dreams. Don't just keep them on there. Either commit or cross it off. What are two things you've considered doing that you've continued to procrastinate? Okay, number three, ask yourself this, your team members. What are you doing that is busy work and not productive work? What are you doing that is busy work and not productive work? And then ask yourself this question. What do you need to change about what you're doing to get the desired result? What do you need to change? For example, um, I've managed all of my own emails until just recently, and I recognize this is really not the best use of my time. So now there's about 20 people whose emails come directly to me, and the rest my assistant manages and and asks me about the ones that I needed. What, What I was doing was busy activity, but it wasn't the most productive use of my time. It's probably something I should have changed five years ago. There's probably something in your leadership you should have changed five years ago. Make the change. If you're not changing, you're not growing, okay? Um, Thank you for sending questions in. Uh, All of these talk notes are available. If you uh, would like to go to life.church slash leadership podcast, they're also available at craigrochellebooks.com. Again, uh, thank you to those of you who are sharing about the podcast on social media. On the first Thursday of next month, we'll talk about uh, part two of institutionalizing a culture of urgency. Uh, Remember, as a leader, you do not have to know it all. 
You do not have to be perfect. Be yourself. Why? People would rather follow a leader who is always real than one who is always right. Thanks again for hanging out with us here at Life Church. Now, as you heard and as Craig mentioned, this is part one of a two-part teaching. If you want to see the next episode or any previous episode of the Craig Rochelle Leadership Podcast, all you got to do is head over to the website life.church slash leadership podcast. You can also find additional resources, show notes, or sign up to have all of it sent directly to your email. Now, as you also heard, Craig loves getting your comments, feedback, and questions for him to answer in upcoming episodes. If you have a question you'd like to hear answered, all you have to do is send us an email to leadership at life.church. Again, thanks again for joining us here at Life Church. We'll see you again next week.